The reality is, space exploration is far less exciting than we were led to believe. The future of the 50s was clearly a fantasy, and after the US won the race to the moon, we were left wondering when we'd have those interstellar exploits depicted on the big screen. I'm Victor and straight out of the Gen Experience, growing up alongside the all new NASA Space Shuttle program. The endless optimism that came with it and being part of the tragic grim reality that comes from braving a whole new world. Seven years after Kennedy's speech that started the space race, we landed on the moon. Four years after that, we had a space station orbiting above us. Yeah, in the 70s. After Skylab fell to Earth, NASA rolled out a fleet of reusable space planes, and the future we've been promised seemed to be closer than ever before. Designs for a reusable space transportation system, or STS, began in 1966. The best concepts were settled on by 71, and then President Richard Nixon approved the program and put the shuttle legacy in motion by 1972. In 1976, the first shuttle was complete and delivered to Edwards Air Force Base in California. However, this shuttle would never make it to space. It was never designed to. While intended for approach and glide testing, it was the public's first look to whet their appetite and build anticipation for the inevitable launches to come. Originally planned to be named the Constitution, a letter-writing campaign by Trekkies seemed to convince the then-President Ford to have NASA make the change. When rolling out for reveal in 1976, the Enterprise was joined by the crew of the iconic USS Enterprise of Star Trek fame. The cast was there, including Gene Roddenberry, for the dedication and to wish it well on the testing it would endure. And it endured a lot to prepare for the arrival of her sisters. Until then, media would take immediate attention and flip the switch on more realistic depictions of space travel in sci-fi, as evident in the 1979 Buck Rogers movie, where our intrepid pilot is blasted into the galaxy aboard Ranger 3. Called America's first deep space probe in the movie, it bore a striking resemblance to a very recent and familiar design. The shuttles were not our first return to space after Apollo. The moon landings were climactic and positioned the US in a way no other nation could equal at the time. But in the early 70s, we had to have a new goal to keep everyone interested. Why not try out our first space station? Forgotten by some, I remember daydreaming about Skylab orbiting above when talk of its imminent fall to Earth garnered more media attention in the late 70s. Only manned for about 24 weeks, it was abandoned in 1974, but would not return to Earth until 1979. When, without much of a plan, the unmanned descent was met with understandable caution, a little fear, and a good dose of the sky is falling, prior to its uncontrollable tumble into the Indian Ocean and a good part of Western Australia. By the look of things, Skylab looks like a great subject for a whole other show. Skylab had served its purpose, and we needed another major milestone, a new goal, a bright shiny object to dangle in front of the world to get its attention. And the space shuttle would do it. The dawn of the space transportation system was here. The shuttles were launched using three sets of rockets working together. Boosters that were released before leaving Earth's gravity to fall into the Atlantic for retrieval and reuse. The external tank that would be carried until right before orbit insertion and then be released while the main engines cut off and the orbital maneuvering system took over for the final placement. To return to Earth, the crew used the shuttle's OMS again to maneuver into position. Once they re-entered the atmosphere using its imperative heat shielding underbelly for protection from the unbearable heat, it would glide in like a space plane for approach and land at Kennedy Space Center or Edwards Air Force Base. Got it? Good, because I'm not repeating that. No one was waiting for Enterprise's test results to start construction on the next shuttle. It went into production immediately after the delivery of the first and was being made space ready. The Discovery was next off the line in 1981 and would complete four final tests during launches from either Florida or California before the first operational flight, STS-5, in 1982, complete with full crew complement and mission objectives. On the return of the final test, then-President Reagan and First Lady Nancy were there to welcome the crew and give a speech declaring the program operational. By this time, we'd already had three presidents involved with the program, and we were just getting off the ground. Crew for the Enterprise tests had only been a pilot and a commander. For standard operation STS missions, a crew of seven would be the norm and be separated into three categories, pilots, mission specialists, and payload specialists. While Discovery was beginning its life, the next shuttle was under construction and would get the name Challenger. Two more to round out the first four would arrive staggered. Columbia, then Atlantis. A fifth operational shuttle was under construction before further work was put on hold in 1983 as the decision was made that only four operational crafts were necessary. Rockwell, 
That was the company given the contract to build the orbiter itself in 1972. My father worked for that company during this time as an electrical engineer. And for his part, however big, it is a great point of personal pride for me. Anyone else have a personal connection to the program, its inception or operation? Please let us all know in the comments. From 1981 to 2011, the success of 133 out of 135 missions is well documented in scientific research, as well as for deployment of commercial, military, and science-related payloads. Launching countless satellites, interplanetary probes, the Hubble telescope, and then again going out for necessary repairs, the crew was often assisted by the RMS, or Remote Manipulator System, or Canada Arm, and sometimes by an astronaut spacewalk. The very idea is anxiety-inducing to many people. Nevertheless, the thrill factor ratchets up every time there was an EVA, or extravehicular activity, during a shuttle mission. For all of us earthbound terrestrials, looking at the heavens, knowing that another human was tethered to their craft via line or that arm in a cold vacuum we could barely comprehend, was still mind-blowing. While completing essential tasks or repair work with tools not unlike those in our garage, they captured breathtaking images to share. The boundless supply of images enthralled every human, clarity and color we had never seen. Each one a new, impressive, and impossible view of our blue planet, a view so very few will ever experience. Each new mission helped build a culture of hero worship for those brave men and women. Pride and worship that had started with the Apollo crews and was not only shared by millions, but much deserved. The nation felt this pride and excitedly waited for each new launch. Space Camp, the actual camp for space geeks, not the movie disaster of the same name, became a reality in 1982. This highly anticipated new camp opened doors and created options for kids who may not feel as comfortable with traditional summer camps. This alternative activity allowed thousands of eager young space hopefuls to be part of the magic that came with interstellar exploration. It was the 1980s that pushed hard the prospect that anyone could achieve the dreams of a future or a career at NASA, even as an astronaut. The cosmos, extended space travel, it all seemed closer during this era. Even popular toys reinforced the space shuttle hysteria. Space travel was not a distant future, but the future was now. Space camp wasn't the only way you could get close to the stars. Kennedy Space Center became more and more popular during this time. Opening in the 1960s, it was second only to Busch Gardens Tampa, offering tours of the facility, at least to the areas you were permitted without being shot for espionage. The underwhelming showcase of donated trade show exhibits did not impress guests by the time Walt Disney World had come to Florida in the 70s. During the 80s space craze, Kennedy Space Center began to shine with a $2.3 million upgrade budget for enhancements to attract more guests with improved experiences and refurbished facilities. These upgrades would continue heavily into the 90s, and today, the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex remains a must-see on a trip to Central Florida. Unfortunately, if you're hoping to see Major Nelson's office or Jeannie's home on the Space Coast from the setting of their 60s TV show I Dream of Jeannie, you'll be sorely disappointed. What the space program began to lack in public relations in 1983, due to more delays than launches, they made up for with firsts. NASA and the astronauts of the space shuttles were celebrities in their own right, and we kept up with their progress. Progress that would include the first woman astronaut. There had been a female cosmonaut, but this was the first for NASA. Covers of magazines and newspaper articles showcased Sally Ride and her role as first female crew member in 1983. Aboard her shuttle missions, she engaged her knowledge and experience as a physicist to improve the knowledge we had of the universe. Of course, the 80s has its own brand of unique strife, but it was a great time of personal growth. We have to celebrate the barriers that were falling. And NASA seemed like the place that did it with gusto. Selected from 10,000 applicants in the first NASA contest to join the program, the first black astronaut took his seat as pilot of Challenger also in 1983. The Air Force pilot and Vietnam vet, Guion, or Guy Bluford, opened the door for various men and women to enter the field and to fill important roles in space missions with their diverse background, culture, and education. This forward momentum allowed young people, no matter who they were or where they came from, to reach for the stars and feel like it was truly possible. Like any peaceful endeavor, eventually military applications are proposed, and the space shuttle program was no different. During a heightened Cold War with the Soviet Union, where Gen Xers worried if each day was the day the bomb would drop, the whole program had its detractors, as then-President Reagan worked to get his strategic defense initiative off the ground and into outer space. Reagan's Star Wars, as it was named, was nothing like the Rebel Alliance or the Empire, but the imagination of the world caused this idea to never get off the ground. Many did not trust that the U.S. could have or should have the capability of surprise strikes, space attacks out of the coldness of the inky black cosmos. There was a lot of fear of the unknown. 
But luckily, as the Cold War ended and the Berlin Wall fell, nuclear arsenals began to reduce, and like the Empire, support for Reagan's plan waned, until it officially ended in 1993. Now, just four years into the space craze filled with endless optimism for what was to come, it all came to a screeching halt. 38 years ago this week, the first major shuttle disaster grounded the program and shocked a nation. NASA's shuttle program had made Americans a close-knit community, and we had just lost some of our own. I was in middle school on January 28, 1986. We were three hours behind Florida, so only minutes after the 8.30 a.m. school bell, the news was out of the 11.39 a.m. tragedy. The intercom crackled on, and the principal's somber voice gave a brief description of what had just occurred. Suddenly, wheeled AV carts with TVs were switched on, replaying the incident endlessly with accompanying explanation and conjecture, as well as the aftermath, live as it happened. Seeing the joy on spectators' and family members' faces change, from elation one moment to terror and confusion in the next, was heartbreaking. The despair was difficult to comprehend, but the gravity of the situation sat heavy, and you quickly joined in the anguish. It was my first real-world U.S. tragedy that I could fully understand, and I even had a hard time doing that. It was made all the more sensational due to a school teacher being on board, the first civilian. Krista McAuliffe had been selected and would serve as payload specialist performing lessons to students once they were in orbit. This was the next big shuttle public relations moment, but she never made it out of our atmosphere. Endless loops of the disturbing explosion leaving questions and horrible images to form in your mind played out. As you might expect, communication took longer to transmit in 1986, and there were still so few details. However, I remember hope. There was a population that held futile hope that the crew had survived somehow on the flight deck. In the cockpit, as it hurtled to the ocean below, people thought they could be alive. You knew it was most likely impossible, but you just wanted to believe it. NASA ultimately came out with some line that they had all instantly been vaporized in the explosion. But more and more evidence showed that the Challenger broke apart, and details leaked that the crew cabin had come down intact, going 200 miles per hour, 17 miles off the coast, where it landed into the water. They most likely were alive during the fall. However, there was also the obvious cover-up that was mounting, and to this day, nobody has come clean on just what the astronauts went through and their ultimate cause of death. Only hypotheses. Krista McAuliffe did make it more real. Her death made us question civilian space travel. As a young man, I remember knowing these astronauts through mass media attention, especially because of the ill-fated school teacher. Now realizing tragedy looked and felt so different than it does in the movies, what was next? Was there a next? Would the space program continue? The crew of the Space Shuttle Challenger honored us for the manner in which they lived their lives. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of Earth to touch the face of God. Thank you. The program was granted for more than two years, but it wasn't the first NASA catastrophe, and it wouldn't be the last. What was on your mind that day during that time? Do you remember? In the aftermath, a new film about Space Camp was scheduled to be released. Filmed in 1985 and ready to go, this marketing nightmare was only delayed five months after the Challenger incident. Many incorrectly thought producers were capitalizing on the horror, but those associated with Space Camp disagreed and thought it would be a positive to release. But nothing could save this story, one where kids of various ages are suddenly and terrifyingly launched into space on the actual shuttle Atlantis. Dealing it another blow was the reason for the accidental launch in the film. It was due to solid rocket booster malfunction, the same as the Challenger. Critic Roger Ebert gave it a one and a half star rating, saying that our thoughts about the space shuttle will never be the same again, and our memories are so painful that Space Camp is doomed even before it begins. What did do well? The G.I. Joe Defiant, a year later in 1987, an enormous G.I. Joe, a real American hero playset of the Defiant Space Shuttle Launch Complex. Complete with boosters and crawler, it was like the entire Kennedy Space Center in your hand and filled with your Joes. Perhaps time was moving on? And this little nugget was a reminder of the promise we were given of space. And we were ready to get it off the ground once again. In 1988, 32 months after the incident, the shuttle program would blast off once again from Florida. Having time to investigate and address the issues said to have caused Challenger to break apart, they were confident to continue. Those next astronauts were very brave, and the missions did continue. The additional shuttle that was going into production back in 1983 got a new lease on life. In 1991, to replace the Challenger, the Endeavour debuted and once again brought the operational crafts to four. The shuttles would persevere and continue mission after mission, with scientific experiments and national security and communications satellite launches. Alas, 
There was no landings on interstellar planets, no battles with invaders bent on ruling the galaxy, no alien discoveries. Well, not that they've admitted, mind you. It wasn't shaping up to be Star Wars at all, and the excitement began to fade away with the shuttle launches being as common as a new blockbuster release. But unlike those, almost no one could tell you what the shuttle mission was about anymore. As I came to live in Florida in the early 90s, the launches were easy to watch for miles around. Seeing my first one from Orlando, I recall how beautiful it was. I understand why locals and tourists alike still flock outside or stand by windows just to watch a blast trail while hoping to spot the twinkle of light caught gleaming from a booster rocket jettisoned to Earth. The excitement of keeping up with the program was fading from the general public. Information on the astronauts and details of the preparation were minimalized, and launches were short story blips on the local news just before liftoff. It had all just become commonplace. By this time, the shuttles and crew had been popularized in heroic fashion in movies and TV. But it was the 2003 Columbia disaster that sealed the program's doom. Had they surpassed their usefulness? Had a tragic misfortune that killed yet another seven astronauts as they re-entered the atmosphere proved that the shuttles were past their prime? From then on, the shuttles were downgraded to transport trucks to complete the ISS construction. As that came to an end, one by one, the shuttles were ceremoniously retired. Atlantis had the honor of the last mission, and as it rolled away to prepare for its final resting place in retirement, there was melancholy for those of us who had lived through the space craze during the Gen experience. Today, NASA is a shadow of its former self, with plans of intergalactic dreams constantly delayed and pushed further into the future. A future that's sadly up in the air. Let's not forget the Challenger, the Columbia, or the 1967 Apollo 1 incident that killed three astronauts on the launch pad from a flash fire in the capsule they could not escape. Let's not forget the discoveries realized with the program of the men and women who risked their lives for science and advancement. The true heroes, the real influencers we can only hope our children will want to emulate. Thanks for joining me on this vital piece of history and just one part of the vastness of the Gen experience. And if you ever get a chance to see the Atlantis Space Shuttle at the Kennedy Space Center, do it. I hope you clicked like, subscribe, and even share this video. Of course, after you left a comment of where you were and how you felt during the Challenger or Columbia incident. Check out the channel and the store for great content from the best generation. Until next time.